What I want to do today is to touch on advanced care planning, which many in the room may be familiar with, um, to talk about the imperative, both the theoretical imperative as well as the research which either directly or indirectly supports the importance of advanced care planning, to also discuss the challenges that remain, to talk a little bit about video as an educational medium for educating patients and families about various things, um, to talk about video not only as an educational medium, but really as a stepping stone to doing more in terms of not only educating patients, but finding out who they are and what their values are. So I look at that as completing the picture through a proposition of the, of the patient or person values. And I'll introduce a methodologic framework that I've developed with my team and the initial testing and future directions of that framework in this this icon has, bears an uncanny um, resemblance to uh, the NBC television icon, but I assure you that they're not um, uh, knocking on my door right now or probably anytime soon, but we'll explain what that is. But as you see, it's, it looks like a peacock, and my acronym, we were talking about how there's a lot of palliative care acronyms. My acronym is, is peacock, or patient-centered oncologic care and choices. So I think everyone has their own notion of advanced care planning. Um, the definition I use is the process by which patients, families, and their healthcare team plan for future medical care. And as a medical oncologist and a palliative medicine physician, I view advanced care planning as part of good medical care, and I view good medical care as palliative care, um, whether it be the care of patients with cancer or not. And I look at it alongside of symptom management as well as the psychosocial supports that patients and their families should receive. So this is the way I view um, advanced care planning within the overall um, paradigm of, of palliative care, including in my realm where we're treating patients with cancer and their family. So a little bit about why advanced care planning is important and, and some challenges. I think everyone would agree that in theory it's very important for patients and families to be informed about what a current situation is and to have their questions answered and their concerns addressed when planning for future medical care. Um, so, Elizabeth, I told you I would put your, your framework, which I really, really like in, in my recent you know, collaboration with, with Lisbeth and understanding that she and her team have, have come up with what I really like is this notion of the need to know and be known. And we'll see this duality playing itself out in um, in the methodologic framework I've come up with in terms of education as well as meeting the person where they are, finding out who this is and what's important to them. So I really like that and um, you'll, you'll hold good company on the same slide as a, as a philosopher who also said it in a certain way, if one is truly to succeed in leading a person to a specific place, you must first and foremost take care to find him where he is and begin there. So that gets at, again, the notion of needing to be known in addition to what sometimes on the medical side of things as a physician we might give information or not give information and not do such a good job of finding out who is this person and how do we make them feel known and this is the secret in the entire art of helping. As I alluded to before there's evidence directly supporting as well as indirectly supporting the imperative for advanced care planning. There's refuting evidence. We've been talking about what recent events both in this country as well as a few years ago um, in my country, um, showing that this is a difficult process, showing that we need to be careful in how we do it. And there is research suggesting that the ways in which we've tried to do it before have not always been successful. So whether it's a paper called The Failure of the Living Will, or whether it is failed endeavors on our part in the States to improve advanced care planning through different interventions, this is a hard process. and. Uh, it's being looked at in the evidence, but still no real clear one right way of doing this. And certainly there are ways in which we need to do better and, and why it's hard. And some of the challenges, we can discuss the prior processes, the, the studies that have been done. Again, there was the support study, which many of you may be familiar with, which was a seminal and negative palliative care intervention, which was based in good sound theory, but unfortunately didn't work. And I think it as well as other things, shows us that there are many, many uh, barriers that still exist, whether it's time constraints, problems with um, prognostication, um, 
differences in opinions or culture, the inability to educate clinicians well on how to um, communicate well with patients and families, the um, <coughs> health literacy issues that exist uh, in a lot of populations. So many, many issues uh, make this a virtual minefield for uh, ideal communication and planning for future medical care. Something that adds, I think, an additional layer of complexity to the care that we deliver for patients with cancer is what you see in this theoretical framework here in B. So if you have someone, um, these, each of these graphs show, and you may have seen this before, it's um, somewhat of a general framework, but on the y-axis would be the functionality of a patient, and on the time x-axis would be how things change over time in terms of that functionality. And we see patients a lot in B where they may start out with a very high or normal level of functionality upon the diagnosis of a advanced cancer and then have this very steep curve or this sh relatively short time period over which there will be a rapid change, a decline in their functional status ultimately leading unfortunately to death in many of the patients that uh, I come in contact with at least. And that creates its own specific complexity. Questions arise like when do we talk about these things? How do we talk about these things? Who talks about them? And I think we would all agree that it's extremely important to address it, as we discussed, but a lot of complexities on top of all the ones that we've previously discussed now in terms of this being a really short time frame. Um, as opposed to other areas, I don't envy my heart failure colleagues, for instance, in C, if you have a person with CHF, they might have a slow and steady decline, but it's punctuated by these acute exacerbations and decline in their functional status often with hospitalization and then a improvement, making it even more confusing for us to know, well, what is actually going on? When is the, the ultimate decline? When does the planning occur? What should the planning be and by whom and where should it take place? So that's a real tough one. And then in A and D are different situations as well. A obviously is some sort of sudden event, sudden death and D would be low functionality from the beginning, leading to a slow and steady decline, such as with um, dementia, for instance. So the timing is a big question that I've been struggling with, both in my research practice as well as um, clinically. And I want to hear your perspectives and questions on this as well, because back here in B, if they're feeling completely well, then a lot of people feel uncomfortable with discussing things that seem like a disconnect. Well, if I feel completely well, and now you're telling me that I have a very severe illness, despite how empathically and humanistically and clearly you've tried to tell me that news, it's still kind of hard to bridge that gap between feeling completely well and having a lot of the issues of needing to plan for the future. So when should we do it? Um, one wise opinion I heard is, quote, you see sometimes we must let the blow fall by degrees, give him time to find the strength to face it. So I'm, I'm, an, I'm an American in, 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 in the UK right now, and this is one of the reasons why I put this slide up here and I alluded to it in, in the title. Does anyone know who said this? You'd have to be a real television fan of your beloved series. Um, so this is, Violet Crawley said this. <laughs> And she owns, as you probably know, many, many of the best quips in the, in the television series. And I thought it was not only, you know, many of the things that she says are very wise and funny. I was sitting there, you know, watching this episode with my wife, worried about my clinical and research paradigm and when do I bring these things up with people. And Violet Crawley says this pretty intelligently in season two regarding the recently war-paralyzed Matthew Crawley. Um, so it doesn't fit completely, but I, I think it speaks to the need to do things um, in, in steps. And this is not new. There are um, advanced care planning paradigms which suggest that at first you should find out the nuts and bolts of who is in the patient's family structure, as you should, who is going to possibly be the main caregiver, the informal caregiver, who is the healthcare proxy, as, as we call it. And then after learning about the patient's situation and ideally learning about their perspective, you might get a better understanding of what their values are and what's important to them. And then finally, when real time decisions need to be made, and ideally after they have had time to have certain things sink in and ask questions and cope and come to terms with certain things, then decisions can be made in real time. 
But as we know, and as we were discussing before the meeting, unfortunately, um, discussions don't happen as often as they should. And unfortunately, medical treatments are delivered in patients where they're not always um, appropriate or beneficial or desired by the patient or family. So video education, video is a potent educational medium. I'm not sure if you're familiar with, with research done by one of my mentors, Angelo Valandis, but this tells a little bit about it. Angelo is a really gifted uh, internist and ethicist who's also had a prior career as a filmmaker before he went to medical school. And he's built his um, academic research career off of this um, um, portfolio of educational videos that he as a filmmaker has, has filmed and vetted by numerous experts in um, palliative care and intensive care and geriatrics and many other um, domains including patient advocates and, 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 and social workers and uh, decision-making experts. And he's studied it um, in various diseases including cancer, so I've been privy to be able to study uh, one of his videos and, and now another video in my current research and looking at numerous topics. So there could be a broad care goals video, which I'll get to in a second, or it could be specifically on CPR and mechanical ventilation, which is obviously just one of the many things that needs to be touched upon, but an important uh, topic and a lot more. So videos are now being made for what is hospice, what is hemodialysis, dementia, numerous languages as well. And the data thus far speak to uh, effects on the reported outcomes by the people in these trials. So we were just having a discussion about what do people say as a report and then what ultimately happens later on down the line and that's a question here. But the research has shown that preferences change. If you show a person a video about broad goals of care, they might at first before seeing the video state that they want all medical interventions including life sustaining therapy such as CPR and mechanical ventilation. And when they see a video and they are educated about what it entails and what they see, their preferences generally change. Their certainty about the medical decisions increases. There are sometimes baseline differences on education or ethnicity levels. Those are erased after seeing these videos. So it has a potent um, educational benefit. And now the group uh, headed by Angelo is undergoing large scale statewide cluster randomized control trials in the states starting with Hawaii right now and doing really interesting things on a larger scale. My question though is, and as we alluded to before, can this move the bar in addition to leading to patients feeling more sure and more certain and having their preferences more in line with their, with their goals, can it actually move the bar and affect change in the care ultimately delivered? So that's one question. And then adding on to that, what about the person themselves do we need to know? So after doing some of this work and entering into a palliative care fellowship and then presenting my research to um, some of my colleagues in palliative care, someone raised a really, really good question, which is, Andrew, this is all really well and good. We should be educating people about what their options are. But what about the other side? What about the other piece of the puzzle? Who is this person? How do you find that out? How do you individualize these things to patients and their values? And so that's what I'm trying to get at with Peacock. So on the first question about whether we can move the, the bar, this shows the primary aim results for a trial that we did using one of the videos showing specifically CPR and mechanical ventilation and educating about that process in patients with advanced GI cancers. These were patients in a randomized control setting who were randomized either to see the video or to hear a narrative about CPR mechanical ventilation verbatim the same narrative but not see the video images. So our primary aim was to see if we could actually move the bar. In addition to people having preferences and certainty um, and education change, could we actually affect change? So we were looking at whether in the one month post test this would change the documented advanced care planning in the electronic medical record, either by an advanced directive, for instance, in the states commonly the do not resuscitate order, or a documented discussion between a patient and a doctor, such as we have discussed CPR, CPR mechanical ventilation, and it does or does not um, align with the patient's wishes for X, Y, and Z reasons. So if you had any of those two, either a document or a documented conversation, that would count as um, some sort of ACP documentation. And <coughs> I'll direct you to the p-value of 0.07, which technically makes this a not clinically significant increase in advanced care planning in the video arm. And we could talk a lot about how this may have been mispowered from advanced care planning rates that we 
um, had used from patients with dementia, which are actually a lot higher. And we can discuss that a lot, but the bottom line is, is that clearly there's no clear signal that it does definitely uh, move the bar. There's a, we thought clinically, a clinical suggestion of it. This is a small trial. <laughs> Um, and again, there were powering issues, but as far as we know thus far, it does not yet move the bar, and these are things that need to be examined moving forward. A busy slide, and only for the purposes of getting a flavor of what patients actually said after they were involved in the trial. These are selected comments only. I promise you that there, if there was any egregiously negative comments towards the video, I would have put it on here. Uh, there were some people who didn't want to participate uh, for those sorts of reasons. Um, we're currently writing this up in order to start transitioning into well, what is important to these people and what are their values in addition to just being educated about their options. And we did qualitative um, analysis to come to consensus on what the themes were. And you'll see the flavor here, but the themes were basically that patients thought that advanced care planning was important um, and that you should better do it early rather than late. And that getting to the issue of paradox, which has been researched a little bit as well. While people wouldn't want to do this if they didn't have to because it's scary or it's upsetting, if they had to, they would want this actually to be done and they would generally want it to be done with, with a physician that they knew well, such as their primary oncologist. So the first person says, catch people on a good day and it's better to do it early on rather than when they are down and out, alluding to probably doing it earlier rather than later. <coughs> there are numerous other um, comments in here getting at some of those same themes and others. Sometimes there's a complexity in the dyad of the patient and caregiver. So in the fourth bullet down, the wife is saying, this is really scary. The patient then replies, this is reality, this is common sense. So there's a lot of complexity here in the numerous um, people involved, whether it's the patient, the family, or the numerous clinicians. So we developed this framework after thinking about how we need not only people to know things, but also to be known. And bear with me because it's a little busy, but I basically see the person with disease as a patient with multiple components, just like a peacock with many feathers. And on the right, there are the external patient-related factors that can be approached, I think, with education like by video. So a patient has their family, they have their healthcare clinicians, and they have numerous healthcare options and technology that they need to make decisions about at some point. And we can inform all three of these things with video to educate the patient and the family about what options are. But on the left, you don't get as much, or at least directly, into that. And so the inherent personhood of this human being, their biopsychosocial underpinnings, is what I wanted to try to take a page out of our psychiatry colleague's book and to move further upstream and operationalize more for us non-savvy, non-psychiatry medical oncologists um, who need something earlier and to try to actually help the patient and the family do it because a lot of oncologists, including myself, is not going, are not going to be able to deliver high quality values directed interventions at the end of life in such ways that Bill Breitbart does with meaning centered psychotherapy or Harvey, Chach Harvey Chachanoff, who I understand lectured here on dignity therapy. So, through collaborations with um, Bill and Harvey, we've tried to operationalize these values-based interventions and create a narrative earlier and in the context of a medical oncology visit rather than later, just before uh, death, which is, again, a very, very important time when these things need to be done, but there's a lot of need, as we know, to do things earlier. So I'm trying to operationalize and change the questions that are being used by our psychiatry colleagues from more of the generativity or life review theme and to change it a little bit more to the slightly more practical issues of goals with treatment, concerns about treatment, sources of support during treatment, these sorts of things. So this is a study now which is, again, it's using a combined psychosocial and educational intervention which we got grant funding for and passed to the IRB to test in newly diagnosed patients with advanced GI cancers. And the reason why I put in bold newly diagnosed is because this has been hard and we've been having lower accrual numbers than we would have liked to. And I want to get your opinions and your questions on, on this after as to how soon is too soon and how can I better improve um, accrual to clinical trials. But it uses as the 
figure suggests first a psychosocial methodology, a series of questions just like the psychiatry colleagues did to guide patients in creating a narrative about their illness, an introspective process where they look into themselves after being guided with certain relevant questions, or we hope relevant questions, to express themselves and then ultimately get a transcribed illness narrative that they can take with them just like they do with dignity therapy and a, a narrative which might be able to actually be shared with the, with the physician and the clinical team such that they can also be informed about who is this person and what's important to them. Maybe someone who values time at home more, more than trips to the doctor's office or someone for whom their faith background is extremely important to them and that is something that should be known in addition to all the other things while patients are undergoing treatment. And then second is the educational methodology, which I've touched on a little bit, but we're using the goals of care video, which broadly over around seven or eight minutes educates patients on three admittedly artificial but broad care categories. The first being life-sustaining therapies, which would be any treatment of a symptom or the illness up to and including hospitalization and including CPR and mechanical ventilation. And then the second paradigm of a limited therapeutic option where it would entail all the same things for treatment of disease with the exception of CPR and mechanical ventilation being two um, particularly intense life-sustaining therapies. And then third, comfort care, just as the name suggests, care aimed for the symptoms of an illness, but not the illness itself. So we're studying this in two parts. Part one is gonna be where we're trying to vet the questions that we're using, because we've never used these questions before. And then part two is ultimately where we're going to be actually determining the primary aim and secondary aims. The primary aim is whether this is a feasible intervention or not. So this is a feasibility study where we're going to be assessing acceptability on three standard and validated Likert scale questions as to whether things are acceptable, sorry, things are, whether things are recommended to others going through the same thing, whether they're comfortable doing this, um, and other acceptability questions. And some of the statistics about how we're setting the bar is there. It's a little artificial, but we think that if 70% um, are composite acceptable answers, then that would deem something to be an acceptable intervention, but lower than 40% not, and the associated statistics therein. So in part one, in order to vet the questions that I'm going to show you and make sure that they are the right questions to be asking people in the situation, we're taking 24 patients, and that's based off of qualitative methodology, which suggests that you need at least six patients per homogeneous group in order to get accurate qualitative cognitive interviewing results. So we are roughly hypothesizing that young and old people, as well as low performance status and high performance status patients might be different in terms of what's important to them and what questions should be asked of them. And therefore with those two groups or four total groups of six, we came up with 24 as our sample size for the part one. And we hope to accrue this over approximately three months using an estimate of the fact that I'm one of 15 GI medical oncologists at Sloan Kettering. I thought we could get this accrued very quickly and that has uh, not been the case, and I want your, your, your perspectives and advice on that. And 30 minutes per subject is indeed what has been happening, um, and it uses cognitive interviewing to, again, assure the appropriateness of these 10 questions that I'll show you. We're using standard cognitive interviewing uh, acceptability uh, queries on contents, clarity, tone, comfort with, with the following questions. So these questions are largely taken um, from an interview called the Living Well interview, which I'm not sure if you use in the UK, and I know we don't use very commonly in the US where it was developed, um, out of the uh, Gunderson Health System in, in, in Wisconsin where they do a lot of advanced care planning. And I've modified it slightly to look at the goals, concerns, and supports of these patients with the questions you see there. And then I've actually put in two questions about the video, which will be part of the intervention as well to see how video interacts with the value systems of the patients, which again has previously not been well documented. And then one final question, I don't know if when Harvey was here, if he was talking about how he was testing one broad question in dignity therapy to see if it could encapsulate everything. So that's kind of what we're trying to do here. Personally, I feel like for all of the myriad things that are going on at a new cancer diagnosis and all of the aspects of treatment, that one question is probably not gonna cut it, but we're all for looking. And if it does, all the better, it would, it would simplify things. So part two, after we vetted the questions to be used, we're going to do a randomized study of 75 patients where we're again assessing the primary aim of acceptability and then other secondary aims such as quality of life, peacefulness, anxiety, depression, treatment satisfaction in a pre-post design. So the randomization will be to receiving no advanced care planning intervention versus receiving video alone 
And then finally, the Peacock intervention where you watch a video and you go through this process of being asked questions about your values and then ultimately receiving a transcribed illness narrative that you can do what you will with, including share with your physicians if you would like, which we'll record. And in this pre-post design, we'll be able to get both at the primary aim as well as the secondary aims. This is a summary of the battery of psychometric tests that we're using. You may be familiar with many of them, standard measures, validated measures for quality of life and other things like anxiety and depression. And so a little bit about the nuts and bolts. Our accrual to date has been low and lower than we would have wanted, which is, I guess, part of the reality of clinical research. But as you see here, we basically opened the trial in October, and here we are in April, only with approximately 10 to 12 consented patients out of the goal 100 for the trial, um, wanting to get this trial done in around two or three year time period. So there's always gonna be, as you know, some ramp up in the beginning, especially when you do it around the time of the holidays, which is one of the reasons why we had none in December. And people really don't wanna be talking about this, per se. Um, we stopped and took a break in February because we wanted to amend the protocol, not only to get a little bit more of a patient-friendly brochure in addition to all the consent forms that, that we have, which are more arduous, but we also wanted to widen the eligibility criteria. So we weren't having that many eligible patients who were appropriate. Our window previously was a new diagnosis of an advanced GI cancer where the prognosis was an estimate of under 12 months but a new diagnosis within three months of the diagnosis. And we were capturing so few people who had had a new diagnosis and had met all the other eligibility criteria, not the least of which was feeling well enough to talk about such things at this time frame, that we expanded it to no longer capture people at the newness of their diagnosis, but they had to be not seen within one, they, they had to not been thought to have been within one month of their death. So we're still trying to catch people somewhat early, recognizing that that is not really a very early time frame. This is a little bit more detail about our screening flow. We've screened over 200 patients, most of whom were ineligible for various reasons that you see there on the right. There were of the 70 eligible people, around 20 who declined for the reasons that you see in terms of not wanting to discuss the topic or feeling like it might upset their family, not wanting to watch the video, not feeling well enough to participate. Things which I think as researchers especially we have to respect, although in the back of my mind I wonder how can we do better at trying to educate patients about what this is, what our intents are, recognizing that again there are going to be people who do not want to consent to such research and for whom it is not appropriate. Um, we've consented 12 and only completed 10 as I said, or a couple who had fallen out due to attrition issues. So this is an ongoing process. In conclusion, so when we're talking about timing the blow, is it a matter of, as some of my palliative care colleagues say, quote, it's always too early until it's too late, which means we should always do it now, or is it there's a time and a place and it's sometimes not appropriate? So I wanna hear your thoughts. And I think that obviously the answer somewhat in the middle and has to be an individualized approach with each patient and family. Um, but as we were talking about, this is a minefield with many complexities and areas where we can slip up. So we need to do better. We'll anticipate the results of this trial. There's going to remain lots of questions about scalability, even if I were to accrue it in the expected time frame and it was a positive intervention on the primary and secondary aim. Who's going to be typing up these, inter these, these illness narratives for all these patients? Who's going to be administering the questionnaires? The physician, the nurse, the social worker? What time and place would they do it? Can the patient and the family be taught to do it on their own? These are all questions that would remain. And then these are only the patients and the caregivers themselves, arguably the two most important people in the process, but what are, going to be, what are the interventions going to be for um, not only the caregivers but healthcare professionals as well? And so some of the research that I'm involved in, as well as non-research clinical endeavors like Schwartz and Arounds, as we discussed, we'll get at some of these other avenues. I want to acknowledge some of my mentors, both at Sloan Kettering and beyond at uh, MGH with Angela Valandis, um, the <coughs> support for both of these trials, which I've discussed today. Um, Elizabeth, thank you very much for bringing me again. And with that, we can take questions and your perspectives. Thank you.